Action, and we're going to do something a little different today. Um, instead of streaming a game, we're actually going to talk about some World War II markings, uh, for specifically for U.S. vehicles. Try to give you at least a little bit of an idea, uh, and this is mostly for miniatures painting and modeling if you're doing like Flames of War, Bolt Action, whatever, so you can get an idea of what would be error appropriate. Now, obviously, if you're only doing one vehicle for like a modeling diorama, uh, you would just find a reference photo of it, but if you're doing a whole unit, you want some more ideas. So that's essentially going to be the focus of this, is to give you some ideas of generally what type of markings were active when and where they would be placed on the vehicle. So we're going to start off with some camouflages. That's pretty straightforward because the U.S. didn't have a lot of camouflage in World War II. Um, this is similar, but not exactly the Sicily camouflage. As far as I'm aware, it was only used for the invasion of Sicily. Uh, you have kind of in the battlefront range, it's called Sicily Yellow, is a color used in addition to the olive drab. It's a pretty straightforward color scheme. I'm not aware of it being used outside of Sicily, but it's not impossible that something like it was used outside of Sicily. Um, there's a different version of this color scheme that instead of the tan has black. Uh, there's actually, if you can find the field manual, it actually has a template inside of it that you can paint your tanks. Um, and this was, the this was the recommended way the Department of Defense wanted the tankers to paint their vehicles. So either this or like the black scheme. The black scheme was more common later in the war. Um, I was actually doing some research on the 761st Tank Battalion and a lot of their M4 Shermans were painted with the black striped camouflage. So that was a reasonably common scheme, but a lot of units just left with the flat OD green. You also have during the Battle of the Bulge, winter camo. Now winter camo, as you can see from me, this is actually pretty accurate, is usually hastily applied. I'm not aware of any specific regs on how you're supposed to apply it. Some units would actually leave like OD green sections open so that they could put insignias and those insignias would be more visible because obviously the insignias were white. We're about to go into that whole thing. Um, the Marine Corps tended to use a good bit more variety for their camouflage. Uh, so if you're doing Marine Corps vehicles, I would recommend finding some reference photos of it. Although sometimes in black and white, it can be hard to tell the exact colors they're using. There were also some variations on the Sicily camouflage that used brown, but those were pretty uncommon. Most of the time it was either the solid black color, um, as far as I can tell, or as far as I remember off the top of my head. Now, now we're going to start looking at the basic ID markings. So <laughs> these are actually from different eras in the war, but um, we're going to briefly talk about one that was pre-war. In fact, this is also pre-war, but that's another thing. Um, pre-war, the markings... All, um, all the vehicles had stars, and the stars were actually this kind of shade of blue. The advantage of that was that it was difficult for the enemy to see. The disadvantage of that was it was difficult for friendlies to see, and that's part of the reason why I'm bringing it up, because markings are always a compromise between you're going to have more friendly vehicles, anti-tank guns, aircraft, etc. looking at you than you will have enemies at any given time. And you want to make sure they know you're friendly. That's actually, in a lot of cases, more important than making sure the enemy can't identify you. So, in that respect, the, like, the really blue, like, the blue, uh, like, kind of medium blue markings didn't really work and were ultimately traded out. So, as far as I'm aware, this marking was never used during the war. Um, as you can kind of tell, it's an inverted version of the Air Force Star. I've only ever seen this, I think it was the Louisiana Maneuvers. They had, to, like, some M3 uh, Lees painted up with this. And it was usually, like, right here, like, on the front or, like, on the side of the hull. Um, but this is probably not something you're going to be using in a Flames of War army. Or bolt action or whatever. Next up, um, Invasion of North Africa comes around. The, they've standardized on yellow markings, um, yellow stars. You also had yellow bands going around the turret. You also had like yellow geographic symbols for, I think, 1st Armored Division to indicate exactly what company and platoon and all that stuff. Um, ultimately, these were kind of simplified to just the yellow star. And then yellow was changed to white because more units had white paint. Like, just straightforward. Um, white paint was easier to come by than yellow. The advantage of yellow is that it's not as visible as white. The drawback is that if you don't have the paint, it doesn't really matter. Now, the problem they ran into with the white star was that it looked, to aircraft at least, it looked too similar to the German Iron Cross. So what they did was they prescribed adding a circle. Originally, the circle was supposed to be yellow. Um, ultimately, this went to a white circle because of, again, shortage of yellow paint. So... The white star with the yellow circle is pretty uncommon. You really don't see it all that much. 
but it does occasionally show up. The white star with the white circle or just the white star by itself are the two most common. Now it's important to realize a lot of these symbols were done with stencils. Like you would just put a stencil on the vehicle and you just slap some paint over it. Well, obviously you can't do a stencil of a circle because it doesn't really work. So what you would do is you would take a stencil and it had breaks in it and you would paint over it. Well, the problem is if you're a soldier and you don't want to be there and you'd rather be doing anything else, what you're supposed to do afterwards is go over and paint the breaks in the circles. Well, a lot of these guys just didn't care enough. They didn't do it. So this is where you'll end up with segmented breaks in the circles at different intervals around it. Um, and it's not... As a modeler, if you like them to be like perfectly aligned with the points of the star or whatever, that's just not... Uh, they could be aligned anywhere. The people painting them just didn't care enough. Um, another important thing to note, like I have seen some weird variations of this where the star is actually bigger than the circle and superimposed on it. That didn't really happen as far as I can tell. Um, now you might be looking at this thinking, well... The if these mud guards weren't here, the circle would go below the vehicle. The Americans would never do that. They would totally do that. Because what the crews would do is they would paint the stars first, and then they would paint circles over it. And if this meant the circle went off the vehicle, they would just paint it anyway and leave part of the circle off. They didn't care. Um, so you will see that pretty frequently. It's also pretty noteworthy that we talked about, well, all of these are done with stencils. What happens if the unit doesn't have stencils? Well, a lot of times they paint the markings anyway. So you can see some freehand stars and some freehand circles. Um, some of them get pretty interesting and are a little messy, but uh, in general, like if you're just looking to crank out an entire project, probably best to just stick with the, the decals that are more solid stencils. Um, as far as placement goes, so side of the turret and side of the hull were fairly common to see basically up to the end of the war. Um, a lot of units would use these. These were pretty easy identification markings. And you, you'll see some accounts where it's like, oh, you have the star on the side of the hull and the enemy would shoot holes straight through it. It's like, if this is the profile the enemy is seeing of your tank, it probably doesn't matter that there's a star here. Like, they just aim center mass and they will take you out. So it's questionable as to whether or not that was actually a problem or it's just a coincidence. Uh, realistically, if somebody, if somebody, if an enemy sees this view of your tank and they start shooting at you, it probably doesn't matter if you have a star anywhere. The front of the hull, however, is a little more changeable. Um, by the end of the war, it's not as common to see stars in the front of the hull. However, there are some interesting variations on markings where... One of them I saw that was kind of fascinating was you take the regular white star and it was essentially underneath this road wheel. So instead of taking all of that off or moving the position of the road wheel, they just painted another star on top of it. So it actually had two stars on top of each other on front of the hole. It's kind of an interesting little uh, detail. Um, another detail was uh, M18 Hellcats in particular because they had German drivetrains. Um, I saw one where it was like a star here, a star here, a star here, and like a star back here too. Because... Uh, the M18 Hellcats would commonly get shot at by friendlies because they had torsion bar suspension instead of the VVSS suspension. Uh, so they would mistake them for Germans. And that's what we were talking about, right? Like, part, a lot more friendly eyes are going to be looking at you than enemy eyes. You want to make sure those friendly eyes know you are friendly. And for that particular Hellcat crew, that took precedence over any concern about Germans being able to identify them. Now we have a big star here on the engine deck. Uh, this seems to be more common in the Pacific theater. Um, you see it in the European theater as well. You also see stars up here. The reason why you kind of, to some extent, don't see them as much as you do on like the side of the turret and hull, even though these are only seen by aircraft and in the Pacific and European theaters, US tanks, like they kind of enjoyed air superiority. The reason you don't see it as much is because once you start throwing your pack rolls and your duffel bags and your canteens, or not your canteens, and your uh, fuel canisters, your jerry cans, and all of your other crap, and your ration boxes back here, this star is not visible anymore. And you start throwing that crap on the top of the turret, this star is not visible either. So I can imagine a lot of crews just didn't bother for that reason, that you know, why carry your equipment when your equipment can carry you, right? If you're using your tank to lug all your crap on the back of the deck, um, there's not really much of a reason to put a star there because nobody will ever see it. So while it certainly would be accurate to put a star here, 
and I can sort and I can imagine Cruz doing it. I've seen pictures of Cruz doing it. There's also a valid reason why you wouldn't bother because you're just going to throw all your crap on top of it anyway. Um, it's also interesting because even if you look at tanks within a unit, the marking will be generally in the same place and they will be generally the same size, but they won't be like 100% like accurate. Like they're not taking out a slide rule and making sure everything is perfectly in line with each other. Like even uh, vehicles in the same unit will have some variation there. Um, so it's, like I said, it's important to remember these are being done by human beings who are just trying to get the markings on. By the end of the war, it's not uncommon to see vehicles that have no markings. Now, in some instances, you can tell the markings have been covered over. Um, in the Pacific Theater, there's a great shot of a Sherman platoon where a lot of the markings have been blacked out by, it looks like grease or mud. It's not easy to tell. Um, there was also one tank where the star was covered up by 100 mile an hour tape, which is an interesting variation. Um, but you can also see a few pictures where there's nothing painting over markings. The markings were just never there to begin with. So it's possible those are replacement tanks or maybe the unit just their SOP that didn't bother putting markings on them. Um, you also had serial numbers to go on the back bumpers. Now there's an entire... I don't want to go too deep into that part, but there's an entire like different types of vehicles have different uh, series of serial numbers allocated to them. So a tank would have a different serial number than an armored car than a half track. Um, if you want to make sure your serial numbers are 100% accurate, feel free to look up those series, but that's a little too in-depth. Um, one interesting paint scheme or that I did see was actually pretty cool. And it would make a good modeling opportunity if you're doing a North Africa army. It was essentially a bunch of M5 Stuarts, and the entire front of their hull had a giant U.S. star on it. And the sides of the hull had full-color U.S. flags. Although, there was a lot of variation in terms of where they actually were. And you can see this on, like, there's some pictures of a parade in North Africa where they had this. So it would be a great opportunity uh, if you want to do some, like, cool modeling or just have some really unique vehicles. Um... And that's one of the unique examples of making sure the vehicle is identifiable to the enemy because ostensibly they were trying to make sure that the French they were fighting in North Africa knew they were Americans and maybe they wouldn't fight or whatever. It didn't really work out, but you know, it made for an interesting paint scheme anyway if you're a modeler that's interested in that kind of thing. So those are the basics. By the end of the war, it would have mostly been this or this. So most of the European like fighting we think of would have been either this marking or this marking, side of turret, side of hull, maybe some on the engine deck or the top of the turret. Um, if you're doing specific eras like North Africa, then you have like this get starts getting involved. Uh, you also have Battle of the Bulge is interesting because a lot of the markings just get whitewashed over. But some of them, like I said, the whole tank is whitewashed except for one circle so that the star can be intentionally visible to friendlies, which is a fun little detail if you want to go to that extra bit of effort. Um, and if you want to do the whitewash, uh, the easiest way to do it is to paint the whole tank OD green and then take one of the little sponges that you'll often get in like blisters, just dab it in white paint and just start like dabbing it all over the edges. It makes for a pretty good and convincing effect. But uh, I hope this was helpful to anybody who's curious about U.S. World War II markings and colorings and any of that stuff. And I hope you guys have a great day.